Welcome to Chapter 3, Presenting Data. Again, this is copyright 2011 by Mary Beth H. Price. And based on her book, Mastering ArcGIS by Mary Beth Price, 5th edition. Map Design Process. This is a short list, basic list, but determine the objectives of the map, decide on the data layers to be included, plan a layout, choose symbols and colors, and create the map. Questions to consider. Who will be using the map? Under what circumstances will the map be used? Is the map likely to be copy or faxed? Fact. Not now anyway. No longer. What objectives should the map achieve and how sensitive is the map information? Choosing layers. Which layers are important and how can you ensure legibility? The mantra goes if you added everything that is possible to a map it would be completely black and we can see by looking at the one on the left the slide on the left that one looks pretty muddied there's seems to be too much information there on the map planning the layout on the left we have a, a an example of a poor design and on the right we have an example of a better design although there is still in my opinion too much white space on that map above population density and definitely below the map we could make the map a lot bigger and in addition you notice in the eastern portion of the United States the counties are smaller and the county boundaries interfere with the actual colors within them which is makes the map look gray as opposed to the colors that are in the legend and of course the map on the right is in a landscape format which is better but still there's far too much white space on the right side of the map basic principles for balance maximize the size of the map relative to titles legends etc I just discussed that on the previous slide distribute elements evenly on the page avoiding blank or cluttered areas there was cluttered areas and blank areas in the quote unquote better design map on the previous slide and align straight edges and use neat lines to enclose map elements and we'll discuss that further in this chapter moving to choosing symbols natural earth tones usually look better than strident colors use pastels for most of the maps use bold colors sparingly for emphasis take advantage of the psychological aspects of different colors and symbols and we'll get into that more in the next one mimic phenomena such as using blue to represent water and understand that if you use red for something chances are people are, may think it's a warning or a bad area make the color ramps easy to understand apply emphasis with color size and thickness symbol psychology where is there less rain and which towns have more people think about that as you look at the image on the top left what is there hopefully by the symbols you'll be able to tell what is there where's the danger this is the red that I was speaking of and then on the bottom left where is the water most of us in the United States can figure out rather quickly that the tan area is the water which doesn't do this map justice symbol trick the vibrating more are pattern obscures the roads whereas on the right they use see-through lines to indicate urban areas choosing symbols which one looks more aesthetic 
which one is easier to understand, and which one shows the roads better. Improving a world map. More pastel and natural colors. Use a color ramp to indicate increasing population and emphasize the important information. Notice that the grid lines have been moved to the background and much less emphasis of color to them. They're much lighter and they're in the background. There's two things going on here in this picture of the world or this map of the world. Pay attention to details. Notice on the left the legend is crowded. There's no space around it. The name of cities.shape is very unclear. You should never have the shapefile name in the legend. And that's easy to fix. Abbreviations. Use standard abbreviations if you use them at all. And poor formatting. Notice how there's there are no decimal places and no commas to indicate the numbers. Whereas these are fixed on the right side. Black and white maps. These are maps that will be photocopied or faxed. And it seems that even though this book has a copyright of 2011, we're not photocopying or faxing many things anymore. Normally everything is sent by internet and maps are designed more for display on screen, possibly paper. But we'll breeze through this quickly. If you have to make a black and white map, Design it in black and white rather than assuming it will copy OK. Use no more than five gray levels. Use different patterns instead of colors. Black and white maps are limited. They might not be able to show as much. Color balance rules still apply. Use mostly light patterns. Emphasize small regions with dark ones. On the left is a geologic map for color printing. On the right is a geologic map for black and white printing. And this is a clear case for not even bothering with a black and white map. Choosing coordinate systems. We'll breeze through this very quickly. On the fly projection, this is a repeat slide. We will not be doing this. It, it should be clear by now that you should have all of your layers in the same coordinate system and same projection since we're building flat maps. The types of coordinate systems again, the unprojected geographic coordinate systems versus projected which are flat maps. Geographic coordinate system properties, they're measured in angular degrees. The length of longitude degree varies with latitude. It introduces distortion when portrayed in a plane as a GIS does. We look at things as a flat map. And it's not suitable for mapping. Using Geographic coordinate systems are not good for mapping any maps that we'll make because they're all flat. On the left we have a geographic coordinate system and the United States appears distorted. On the right it indicates always use a projected coordinate system for mapping. We talked about that. Types of projections. There's a cylindrical, conic, and azimuthal. And that's the changes that it makes when you extend out the latitude and longitude. All map projections introduce distortion. The type and degree varies with the map projection, as shown below. When using a projection, one must take care to choose one with suitable properties. And that is discussed further in the reading. But if you're going to preserve area, or you're going to preserve distance, or direction, or shape, you need to choose the proper projection. In most cases, we're mapping smaller areas, so we'll be using a state plane when creating our own maps. 
small scale maps distortion is inevitable so the purpose helps us make the choice equidistant maps when distance are, are important equal area map when areas are important conformal or compromised projection for general purpose maps and notice that coordinate system names generally indicate the locale and purpose it is optimized for and use these clues for a choice for example North American Albers equal area conic so that's a conic projection from a cone and equal area areas will equal what they are on the ground large-scale maps local city county maps or smaller states choose the appropriate UTM or state plane zone it minimizes distortion over a specified zone and best used for only for areas within the zone for example if we are mapping the western complete western side of Washington we'd use UTM uh, zone 10N on the left if we're mapping the northern section of Washington we'd use state plane north the southern section would be state plane south here is UTM again universe Universal Transverse Mercator, notice has UTM Zone 10 is right here. It's based on the Transverse Mercator cylindrical projection. The world is divided into 60 zones and there are 6 degrees wide. Distortion is minimal within each zone and maps of different areas. If you have maps of different areas, use the best zone. Best for maps covering small area in one zone only here are the state planes shown much closer you have north and south and there's a unique FIPS number uses several types of projections eastern west zones generally conic north and south zones are general UTM graticule grids the north arrow is not appropriate for some projections because they distort direction. You should place graticule grids on the map instead. Notice over here, this is when you should not have a north arrow because north isn't necessarily up. It's more this way, as these lines are going this way. So obviously, this is north. That is not north. And maps that distort distance should not have scale bars as well. Other type of map grids. There's a measured grid in UTM meters, as indicated by the side. And then reference grid, where we have letters across the top and numbers down the bottom for locating things. Here we have a another projection on the fly we have data in different coordinate systems the display units show up on the bottom right the stored units are fixed by the data coordinate system and that translates to the map units which are fixed by the map coordinate system and there is a difference between the map coordinate system and the data if you do it properly these should be the same Here's some more unit terminology. Map units are determined by the data frame coordinate system. Display units can be set by the user so that the coordinates may be viewed in any desired unit, such as miles. And page units show the location on the map page layout, usually in inches or centimeters. And this is just a very busy slide showing um, the current scale up top the units here you can choose meters for the map excuse me for the display and then the position bar shows the current location of the cursor and down here it's in meters setting the display units it's very simple. 
this is discussed in the book. There's no need to discuss it here. It's a simple task. It's available in the book. About ArcGIS now. <clears throat> Page layouts and map scales. Map layouts. This is to create hard copy map. Place legends, titles, scales, and north arrows. Include tables and graphs. And add images or logos. Just a varying way to create maps. And we can do this using the layout toolbar. You can hover over each of these items to see what each of them are. Or you can pause this presentation and make a note here. Take a screenshot of the slide if you'd like. Using the zoom tools, use the tools toolbar to adjust the map extent inside the data frame. Use the layout toolbar to adjust the map, adjust the page inside the arc map window. And you may want to give these both a try to see how they work. They look similar, but they work entirely different from each other. Steps to layout. You're planning the map, setting up the map page and data frames, add a legend, to scale bar, titles and text, objects, neat lines and backgrounds, add graphics, and then print the map. When you want to add these items over here, you will have to be in the layout format. And I believe back on the last slide, right down here with the arrows pointing is the layout. One is the data and one's the layout. Make sure to choose the layout. Visioning on the map page. You have to choose the paper size and landscape or portrait, data frame, size and position, the map scale, choose good margins and then use a grid to align features. Often use a grid to make sure that all my items are lined up. These are ways to set the map up. Use a predefined map and that's a template when starting the map. You, s you can set up the page size, data frames and other elements yourself. And then you also may switch to another template after the map has been created. And that's this button down here. And you may hover on your own, on your own screen, to see how that works. Hover, and you'll get a tooltip. Aligning frames. This is a an easier way to align the frames than doing it by eye. You can go to data frame order, moves things up and down, and this is. It's just a tool that GIS offers to help you align the data frames. This is the page and print setup menu. You'll see this. You'll use it often. Easiest way to learn it is to um, use it. And you'll be using it during class. Composing frames. Click and drag the active frame to move it or change its size. Or you may set the size and location explicitly. You can tell it I want to reference this corner and position it at this X and Y. And you'll do both in this class. Scaling the map. This is automatic scaling. This is a fixed scale. And then we have fixed extent. And the fixed extent is the one I use when I'm done with the map. When I'm finished and I don't want to mess up where the placement is or the size, I'll change it to fixed extent. Next topic is labeling and annotation. Labeling options. There are di dynamic label labels that were introduced in chapter two. A layer property set for each layer they're placed automatically for an entire layer. There's graphic text, which is simple graphics placed and edited on the layout, and they are saved as part of the map document. And then there's annotation, which is usually created from dynamic labels, the one up above, 
and they can be saved and edited for exact placement. You, you normally, if you're going to use a lot of labels, you'll use dynamic labels, convert them to annotation, and make your final edits. What are dynamic labels? Dynamic labels are ones that move with the data, and they move based on what's on the screen. Graphic text are notes that you add, for example, a comment, as shown here, titles, those type of things, graphic text. They stay where you put them for the most part, and you set the information yourself. Multi-line labels, this is adding text in class. I'll show you that polygon text or rectangle text are my two favorites because it allows you to add borders, remove borders, adjust the size with the corner dongle, the edge dongle, or the top dongle. And then there are a plethora of options you can do to make your, make your text look right on the page. The label tool. There's label tool options, layer properties. The label tool creates a label from the display expression field in the attribute table when you click on a feature. And you'll do this in practice and it'll make a lot more sense. Annotation. And again, this was the one that can be created from dynamic labels and then edit individually. The problem is once you change them to annotation, you're stuck with them unless you restart everything and just delete your annotation. They're no longer dynamic when you change them to annotation. It provides precise control of each label. That means it's very, very helpful if you're almost done with your map. And they can be stored two ways, as text in the map document or as a feature class in the database, in the geo database. Default label scaling, the size of the labels and symbols are specified when they are created. By default, they remain the same size as the user zooms in and out. If specified as 10 point labels, they are always 10 point labels. 10 point works up here, but once you zoom in, it's not so efficient to have 10 point labels. They should probably be bigger. Reference scale. Alternatively, symbols and text can change in size when the user zooms in or out. The reference scale is the scale at which symbols will appear at their assigned size. If a reference scale is set, then symbols and text change size when the map scale changes. They only appear at their assigned size if the map scale once again matches the reference scale. This can be adjusted. You choose at which scales these things happen. Prepare to create annotation. Zoom to the scale at which the map will be optimized for viewing. And this will make it become the reference scale. You set up dynamic, dynamic labels with the desired properties and turn them on for the layer. Turn off the layer for layers, turn off the labels for layers that should not be converted to annotation. Creating map annotation, created as map graph or graphics on the map page. They're edited with the drawing toolbar and they become part of the data frame. Placing overflow annotation. Unplaced annotation is put in an overflow window. The user places each label individually or deletes it. Data frame annotation groups. Annotation saved in the map become part of the data frame. You open the data frame properties to edit the annotation properties such as the reference scale. As shown here, the reference scale. Use remove group to get rid of the annotation or to remove it. Feature annotation. Stored as a geodatabase feature class. It appears as a label in the table of contents. 
you add the feature class to you can you may add the feature class to many map documents it must be edited during an edit session which will be discussed or is discussed in chapter 14 and again overflow labels are placed during an edit session adding map elements adding a legend insert legend and you'll get a legend actually it opens the legend wizard it will not come up as looking as neat as this one but that's how you insert it the legend wizard guides you through the process of creating a legend usually you'll create a legend using the legend wizard and use a lot of the defaults at first and then as you grow accustomed to the software you can start modifying the properties to make it look better as your maps improve some more about the legend wizard legend wizard here's the frame area the background the drop shadow normally wouldn't use a drop shadow but you use a background often borders often depending on the look of your map and then you can choose the shape that appears in the legend instead of just a rectangle you may choose things such as a park or rever reserve I guess it says preserve that would be good for Mount Rainier National Park for example more on the legend wizard this portion of the legend wizard is interesting it actually lets you set the spacing within the legend and a lot of times people just breeze through this because it looks too complicated but here you can see the word spacing and between the title and the next line and here it is the title and the legend there's or there is 8.57 points and you can think of them as pixels but so you don't want it wouldn't be 8.57 inches obviously and the best way to work with that is to play with it as you create your labels, excuse me, your legend. Legend styles. There's a m multitude of choices. You may choose, and this is a great example. I would actually take a screenshot of this because there are a plethora of different choices, and this is a great example. If you just want a basic, basic legend, this is what you choose. If you want uh, more of a description you may choose this one and then if you're getting to have if you want more even more data up at the top the rock unit geology legend etc you may oops you may choose this one but take a screenshot of this and save it put it in your notes it'll be helpful changing the legend style this is where you have a multitude of legend choices that's why I would go back a slide and pause go back in the video and pause and take a screenshot of this sheet this is also a good one I would make a notation of this take a screenshot of this if it's not in your book because this is very helpful to know what you're getting when you select a certain style Manage, managing the styles this would also be another good screenshot it, it lets you know exactly what you're editing when you're editing it and if this is not in the book this would be a great one to take a screenshot of adding a scale bar very simple insert scale bar and then you choose try to choose one that's simple like this choose your division unit as in miles your subdivision and your divisions notice how these are subdivision this is a full division the scale bar size is de determined by division settings and the map scale so it changes with your map scale always have a nice number at the end don't have 2.38 miles at the end of your scale bar If the scale changes, so must the scale bar. So notice how it's changing between this scale and this scale. And then 
there are some other options adjust the division value or adjust the width you can decide how you want your scale bar to change here it changed it kept the same number of miles 750 it just got longer here we have the options of adjusting the division value adjusting the width and adjusting the number of divisions and again I would not leave it at 2.4 miles I would use perhaps three miles two miles perhaps two and a half miles the best way to learn this is to add, start adding scale bars and working with them a north arrow the common practice is keep it as simple as possible the focus of your map should not be the north arrow choose something very simple insert north arrow and choose and then pay, place it indiscreetly in the map so that it's there for use but is not overbearing and also if north is up you may not even need to place the north arrow normally north is up on maps creating frame grids I don't use these very often normally I'm mapping such a small area but this is how you would add a frame grid grids and graticules again you may pause this and look at it more or the best way is to go to a, a bigger map in your labs for example and start to work with it and follow the directions you may do the lab that comes with this if it's not in a, a requirement for some classes this is a required lab lab 3 in the book but if not you may go through and do it or if you just want to see the videos on how this works you may watch the videos that came with your book text and titles I normally do not add a title by insert title I use insert rectangle text so I'm gonna skip over this if you want to use title you may but it's not as handy as inserting rectangle text inserting pictures insert picture choose the picture and it goes right in pretty simple it's similar to adding pictures to Microsoft Word so there's no need for me to go over that neat lines some maps call for a neat line some lines some maps don't I would choose something simple in the border sometimes you can use a background if you know you're going to have some water that doesn't have its own layer you could use a blue background to get a water layer and here you can choose the gap and the rounding in the labs you'll be using some neat lines notice here that it's not the same on the left and right here we can just barely fit the arrow in over here you could fit two or three so this is a horrible example of a neat line on the right side also the double border is kind of distracting to me adding graphics not used a lot I can't say that I've even used a graphic such as these but you can insert uh, you can choose the shape and then you get a multitude of shapes what I do use is the uh, the text where you add the text part which I showed earlier and will probably show again reviewing and printing here's how you print your map you choose the printer you most of the time will say okay take a look at the preview because obviously this one is not ready to print you need to adjust some things over here we have a, a funny ratio of one to three just be sure to make it look nice in your preview before you print export the picture as a file we do this a lot normally we'll choose PNG which is right here because this is a lossless compression method and 
it's much better than JPEG. JPEGs are lossy compression and they degrade over time of saving, opening, saving, opening. This is how you do it. You go to File, Export Map, and then you choose usually PNG. If you know how to use Adobe Illustrator, you will probably want to export an AI, which is Adobe Illustrator format. If you use Power, uh, excuse me, Photoshop, you may want to use EPS, or if you want a big file format, you may use TIFF. But for the most part, PNG is the one you want to use. It works in Word documents and it works on the web. It works for showing on the internet. And this wraps up chapter three. If you need further detail, feel free to watch again and then pause and take screenshots and definitely consult your book because there's a lot more information there that can, that can fit on these slides.